In this lecture segment, we continue our discussion of modern art isms in the early 20th century, with a focus on Cubism and the revolutionary avant gardes it inspired. We continue to talk about a whole slew of movements or groups, these isms, in the early part of the 20th century. Many are concurrent with each other and they share back and forth. The group we are dealing with today are those isms that responded to Cubism in some way. We are in Europe during the period leading up to World War I, but we'll also be talking about art between the World Wars. Cubism arises in Paris beginning in 1907 from a collaboration between Pablo Picasso and George Braque. Picasso is from Spain where he was academically trained. He moves away from that training and you can see the development of his style in these two self-portraits. From his blue period where we see the 20 year old Picasso depicted in vibrant colors with his face modeled in color to his cubist experiment from just a few years later in which he shows his faith broken up into planes geometric shapes cubism is rooted in nature they never lose the object they never abandon the depiction of the natural world so it's not fully abstract but the main premise of cubism is to abstract form using geometric shapes Picasso's Les Demoiselles d'Avignon from 1907 wreaked havoc on the conventions of Western art. Picasso depicts a group of prostitutes in Barcelona. Over a period of seven months and dozens of sketches, Picasso worked out how to depict the bodies and still life shown in this space. He takes this common subject, the female form, we've seen it so many times, the sexually available woman, and Picasso fractures the shapes of the women, showing both their 2D and 3D character breaking the bodies into planes, as if seeing them from many angles. Picasso refused to talk about cubism for a long time, but eventually stated, I paint forms as I think them, not as I see them. He rejects naturalism and instead takes a form from the natural world and breaks it down into geometric shapes, like you see here in the still life. He shows multiple perspectives in a single picture, and in doing so flattens out the space, negating any sense of an illusion into space. He uses multiple points of view, looking from above and then looking straight on, showing the influence of Cezanne, whose work Picasso knew. He also shows his awareness of ancient sculpture, like the Koro statues with one foot forward, as well as African art, especially masks, which he owned. This is an example of primitivism, the rampant appropriation by modern artists of the art of non-Western visual cultures, artistic colonialism in essence. Picasso is among those who treated the artistic traditions of non-Western cultures as simple, authentic, and instinctive, using what he took from those cultures as a tool to help him approach art making in a different way. He takes on a traditional subject in art history, the nude female body, and turns it on its head. The beginnings of cubism that we see here come to fruition in this work of art from 1912 depicting a still life. It's about the same size as a legal sized piece of paper. We see a chair, a table, a newspaper, lemons, a knife, and a glass. And we as a viewer have a visual puzzle to figure out. Jou is the first sound in the French word jouer, meaning to play, and jeu means game in French. He is messing with us, bringing the viewer into the game of interpretation as he deliberately builds ambiguity into the picture. Are we looking down at the chair or at a table? Is this a mirror image and what is real? The caning here is not painted, and it's not actual caning like we see on this chair. It's oil cloth printed with the design of caning. So this is cloth made in a factory and glued onto the canvas. But we also have painted objects like the lemon and the glass fractured into geometric shapes. Cubism thinks through reality and presents those thoughts about form all at once on the canvas. There's a lot of mental effort that went into the construction and execution of this object. Picasso used rope instead of a frame to edge the work. This is a collage, one of the earliest in which the artist combines different materials and elements and glues them to create the work. Collé is the French word for glue, thus collage. Picasso elevates mass-produced objects to the level of art, bringing factory-made rope and cloth into a painting to hang on a wall. You can also see another one of his collages here, where he combines pieces of paper from the popular press, wallpaper and construction paper, to produce a work of art, creating the form of a bottle, ashtray, and cigarettes through shape and snippets of the world. Cubism has a massive influence on what happens next. 
we see the development of a modern grammar of objects, a way of showing form using multiple viewpoints, showing objects occupying both time and space, creating works of art that acknowledge they are painted constructions, paint on a flat canvas. And this new approach to art making has a direct impact on avant-garde movements that are associated with political upheaval who want to change the world, the revolutionary avant-gardes. In this group of isms, we see the influence of the cubist experiments and how objects are depicted, and in the inclusion of non-fine art materials, mass-produced objects, into works of art. We also see non-objective or fully abstracted art, and art that is linked to political and social change. Futurism is founded in 1909 or 10 in Italy, and Italy is actually Italy at this point, instead of city-states. It's founded by a group of artists who believe the classical past of Italy and the contributions of the Renaissance are hampering the progress of Italy and getting in the way of it moving forward as a modern nation. They publish a manifesto to express what they are all about and create art in an effort to make a new artistic legacy. They feel the tensions in Europe and the impending war and want it to come and think of war as a cleansing that will help society start over. They love the machine, factories and mechanical things and have performances like the one you see in the drawing here in which they try to entertain and annoy the audience using noise machines that produce sounds of clanking, grinding, the sounds of progress and in which they advocate for the destruction of history. This sculpture from 1913 by futurist Boccione depicts a figure from nature. We can tell that this is a figure moving through space, but this figure does not have an idealized naturalistic body. This body is cubist. The form has been broken up into planes and shapes, as if a cubist painter was depicting the form according to its shapes. In his sketches, the artist was clearly trying to work out a machine-like musculature that creates a new type of ideal, a form rooted not in the classical aesthetic, but in the machine, the factory, the robot. It's made of bronze, which we know is a venerable, ancient medium brimming over with connections to classical art, but here used not to show the naturalism of the form, but to show its machine-like character. If we compare this to the Nike of Samothrace, we see that he's stuck with the idea of the figure moving through space, but this figure does not alight and glide. This figure clanks and thunks as the bronze of the figure appears to move itself forward, more like a transformer than a sculpture. He makes sculpture for the modern world, the world of war machines and factories, with cars, trains, and airplanes. He expresses the dynamism and speed of modern life using cubist visual language. Russian artist Natalia Goncharova was trained in Moscow but made the European art circuit. Her work was shown in Paris in 1906 around Fauvism and when Cubism was developing, so, and she exhibited with Der Blaureiter in Germany. In Moscow there were also a couple of collections of French modern art, and one of Matisse's most ardent patrons lived in Moscow. Her self-portrait here shows that she soaked up what she's seen of French modernism, bringing colors like Fauvism and planar forms like Fauvism. A futurist travels to Russia and she hears his lectures. She then founds Rayonism, an avant-garde movement, in Moscow. In this work of hers we see the breaking apart of the object. It's fragmentation that here is a bit like seeing an object through a kaleidoscope or a lens that mimics how insects see, that allows us to see multiple planes at once. Goncharova tried to capture this multiplicity of vision, not from an academic or classicist perspective, or from the point of view of an impressionist or post-impressionist, but by showing how light reveals multiple planes at once. And her goal as an artist is to show the light, the rays, at one time. Rayanism helped Russian art to pull away from its own academic heritage and to break their rules, their conventions of art. Before Rayanism, art in Russia was controlled through a system of royal patronage from the Tsar, the production of art for the elite, like what we saw in France. There's a powerful Russian academy, and when the Bolshevik Revolution begins in 1917, in which the Tsar and his family are killed and a new order is established, the style of the revolution is avant-garde modern art. And the style that is associated with the revolution and the new government is suprematism. The Russian artist Mayevich comes from a poor Russian family, wants to be an artist, 
studies in Moscow, and becomes familiar with artistic trends in Europe due to the strong collections of French modern art in the city. He does some impressionist work, primitivist work, and cubist work, like the comparison here between one of his collages and Picasso's. We see the same interest in the materials, the emphasis on shapes, and the use of words to flatten out the fragmented space. But then he moved on to abstraction. We talked before about how when a form from nature is abstracted, it includes the basic elements to tell us what it is, but it does not look like the actual object in nature. Mayevich produces full abstractions, non-objective works of art, works of art without objects in them. His Black Square from 1913, and it's dated 1913 because for Mayevich, the date of a work of art is when he had the idea, not when he actually painted it, but it's painted in 1915. The painting shows just a black square on a prepared canvas. He, in essence, takes cubist visual language to its conclusion. The square is the only element in the composition. Mayevich said about this work, In my desperate attempt to free art from the burden of the object, I took refuge in the square form and exhibited a picture which consisted of nothing more than a black square on a white field. And lest you think this is easy to paint, when you get close to a Mayevich, you can see how much he worked the surface with underpainting and planning and revisions and corrections. Scholars have talked about how this work is a modern icon for the 20th century. In this view of a Mayevich exhibition, we see how the painting has been hung up high in the corner, which was the traditional location for an icon to be hung in the home of an Orthodox family. So he transforms an established tradition of putting a spiritual image in a corner to elevate the viewer by giving it a modernist bent, replacing the icon with the modern icon. In this example, he depicts a series of red, re red rectangles on a white background. Because he had already removed art making from needing to connect to the natural world, he was free to explore form. But this is not an exercise in art for art's sake. This still has purpose and meaning. For Mayevich, these shapes were expressive of feeling, and the white was nothing, in which for him expressed the suprematism of pure feeling in creative art. And images like this are apart from the real world, and instead show a spiritual world, using a pared-down modernist visual language. In this example, the red rectangles appear to move upward and elevate the viewer, creating another version of a transcendent experience, just using a different stylistic language than we have seen before. This essential language of basic form, line, and color is a fully abstract modern visual vocabulary indebted to cubism that then appears in all realms of visual art and architecture. Constructivism is a built version of suprematism. El Lizitsky was a Jewish artist in Russia and had to move to Germany to get art training, as he is, was not allowed to enter the St. Petersburg Art Academy. He heads back to Russia at the start of World War I. He transforms suprematism from two dimensions to three dimensions, as you see in this example. This is one of his pro un series that melted architecture with the language of suprematism. He creates an installation in this work, or a work of art designed for a particular space to create an environment. He brings together painting, sculpture, and architecture, again intended to be elevating and connect the viewer to an ideal realm. Artists during the period of the World Wars reacted in myriad ways to the events of their time. Mayevich and Lizitsky used a pared-down modernist visual vocabulary to support revolution and the overthrow of the status quo. Other artists used a similar vocabulary to also seek an ideal, a way to express or create order in a time of chaos, including de style or the style, also called neoplasticism, founded by Mondrian and Van Duisburg. Dutch artist Mondrian was academically trained and, like Mayevich, passes through all the isms, Impressionism, Pointillism. He sees Cubism in 1912 when he lives in Paris, but he wants to create a pure painting that has nothing to do with nature. He and Van Duisburg arrived at this pared-down vocabulary, following a process from nature to the abstract, as you see in this series of drawings of a cow by Van Duisburg. He uses the flattening of form from cubism and the faceted nature of cubist objects to help him break down the cow into pure form. He shows us how he abstracts the form until we are left with geometric shapes only. Mondrian boils down his visual language to vertical and horizontal black lines and the three primary colors, red, yellow, and blue. For these two artists, this style was a perfect eternal style that was spiritual, that created a pure reality because it was not based on imitating nature. It is free from nature and is present in reality as the painter itself. He dispensed with the traditional frame, as you see, and designed his own in this little painting so he could push the picture forward into our space. Mondrian in this work created a carefully crafted object, precisely arranged and balanced, to present a harmonious image of universality, 
life in the verticals, death in the horizontals, a pure ordered reality made possible by abstract visual language. Dada is another reaction to war. Dada is a movement that grows out of cafe culture during World War I when thinkers and artists react to the chaos of war with more chaos. If reason and logic caused war to happen, then they should be rejected and instead the irrational and absurd should be embraced. Like the futurists, they want to destroy the past and replace traditional historic art with new art, but they are anti-war and even anti-earlier modern art. They have performances of sound poems with no meaning, as you see here in a photo of Hugo Ball, a founder of Dada, and the nonsense poem he recited. According to the story, Jan Arp made this collage when he got frustrated with a drawing he was making and tore it up, letting the pieces fall to the floor, and then later noticed that the scraps had all the expressive power that he had tried in vain to achieve. He creates a work of art that is literally built of the scraps, the fragments of another work of art. So it was only when he allowed chance to take over and gave up artistic conscious control of the process that he was able to make a truthful object that did not require the artist's hand, that was depersonalized that was created by nature and chance. What a contrast to the process of Maevich and Mondrian, carefully planning the work of art using reason, rationality, order, and logic. In Dada, we have works of art produced not through conscious action, but by letting the subconscious take over, by letting it be an automatic process, and by letting chance rule the creation. The movement into the mind and the relinquishing of control in Dada contributed to surrealism, which emerged in Paris in the 1920s between the wars. Surrealism, like Dada, rejected rationality and the status quo of Western society. Except for Dada, the other avant-gardes we've looked at in this lecture used the visual language of cubism. In surrealism, artists return to the natural world and show nature, but they show the nature of dreams with weird juxtapositions, allowing the subconscious to associate things together that don't go together, or to put objects in a setting where they do not follow the laws of physics. Swiss artist Merit Oppenheim was a key player in surrealism in Paris in the 1930s. Merit Oppenheim's object is a teacup covered in gazelle fur. Supposedly, the object originated from a conversation over lunch in Paris between Oppenheim, Picasso, and another artist. She purchased the cup, saucer, and spoon from a Paris department store and covered them in gazelle fur. She created, in essence, a surrealist sculpture, but she did so not using traditional materials, but by using a mass-produced object from the regular world, called a found object. This object belies its function. An effective cup can't be made of fur. It simply doesn't work. And the human tongue does not want to drink from a fur-covered cup or saucer, a nonsensical juxtaposition of two objects that could only really go together in a dream realm. It's like the work of art is living, like Chip in Beauty and the Beast, or like Ron's rat turned into a cup in Harry Potter. It's an object that does not gel with reality. In juxtaposing a cup, saucer, and spoon with fur, she puts together an object that does not make sense and brings up a whole slew of associations that deepen its meaning. It evokes nature through the fur, but evokes tea drinking and domestic life in the Western world as well. And this brings us full circle. Although she did not use cubist visual language, she uses everyday objects in art, subverting the traditional media for art production, like Picasso did in his still life with chair caning, blurring the boundaries between modern art and the stuff of mass production and popular culture. So when we arrive at around World War II in Paris, we see that artists have rejected the art traditions we've been tracing. We have non-objective, fully abstracted works of art. We have a new range of materials being used to make art, like found objects. We have new processes for art creation, using chance and trusting in the unconscious mind to create truthful objects. No longer do works of art need to have any connection to the natural world. We have works of art used to express emotions through color and form. We have movements and artists who wanted to use art to renew society tearing down what was before and making something new and better. These trends of modernism continue as we move into the post-World War period but shift our story to the United States.